This is Chapter 9, Transportation Fires and Related Safety Issues. The objectives of this chapter are to examine fire behavior and safety related problems in transportation vehicles encountered by firefighters, to describe fire problems and safety issues experienced with transportation vehicles, and explain actions that may be taken to resolve these issues. To examine and describe special fire behavior problems one might encounter with each of the classifications of transportation vehicles. To explain the importance of fire pre-planning and familiarization procedures for each of the categories of transportation vehicles. Fires and related emergencies occurring in transportation vehicles are examined in this chapter. Concerned with the growing number of transportation vehicles death and injuries, the U.S. Fire Administration in 2003 funded an examination by the National Fire Protection Research Foundation into transportation related deaths and injuries to identify the number and impact of these incidents. This report used as the basis for understanding the depth of the nation's transportation vehicle fire and related safety issues. The report found that during the years from 1997 to 2002, an average of 399,939 fires occurred in transportation vehicles. Each year, these fire incidents result on the average of 587 fire deaths, 2,347 fire-related injuries, and 1.24 billion in fire losses. Because of the wide variety of transportation vehicles under vehicle classification system used by many organizations, the number of vehicle categories has been reduced to cover only major vehicle classifications. These categories include passenger car fires, truck and recreational vehicle fires, rail transportation vehicle fires, marine vehicle fires, and aircraft fires. Specific fire problems are identified as well as any unusual fire behavior and safety issues facing the first responders. Although fire principles and suppression tactics are similar to structural and wildland fires, certain unusual and dangerous fire behavior situations arise from transportation vehicle fires. Passenger vehicles differ from other classifications as these vehicles can be brought to a stop rapidly and evacuated almost immediately. Using this basic premise, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration developed a small-scale regulatory fire test for vehicle interior materials in the late 1960s and has continued applying the same test today. During the 60s and 70s, many of the materials used in private passenger vehicles were non-combustible. Recently, there has been a considerable growth in the use of combustible plastics, increasing the fire danger without a concern for fire safety. The data from the 2000 USFA Transportation Vehicle Report shows annually passenger road vehicles were responsible for almost 60% of fire-related fatalities occurring in transportation vehicles. This study reports that fires and safety issues in newer passenger vehicles is a larger problem than most of us believe. While a great deal of research has been devoted to improving the safety record of these vehicles, some of the safety devices have created safety and fire problems for firefighters. Vehicles built prior to the 60s were routine, routinely extinguished with small booster lines that could be quickly applied as they provided sufficient water for most fires. Occasionally a fuel tank was involved in a fire or the tank was damaged and flammable liquid escaped, creating a problem requiring more water than a booster line could apply. The hydraulic cylinders and the front and rear bumpers are designed to absorb a 5 mile per hour crash test without damage. However, firefighters need to take caution as bumpers can explode or react during the operation of an extrication tool under the intense heat given off by a flammable liquid fire. Another problem facing first responders is the accidental deployment of active airbags during vehicle rescue. Newer vehicles have a Supplement Restraint System SRS, which must be considered when cutting through undeployed inflators hidden in a roof pillar, dash, or behind the roof line or trim of the vehicle interior occupant compartment. The side impact curtain is one of the latest innovations offered by the auto industry for side impact and rollover protection. Side impact protection systems react more quickly and deploy more forcefully 
than front restraint systems because of the shorter distance between the point of impact and the occupant. The inflator produces large volumes of pressurized inert gas that fill the appropriate impact curtain during the deployment stage. The pressure vessel and hybrid inflators will have a stored gas static pressure ranging from 3,000 psi to more than 4,000 psi. It is possible that firefighters could inadvertently breach or rupture a hidden impact inflator while dis displacing or removing a roof. At fires along roadways, firefighters are often in more danger of being struck by another vehicle than of being injured by the fire. To provide some protection, fire departments often have policies and procedures in place to establish a safe working area while working on roads or highways. These often involve positioning of apparatus, using warning and marking devices to alter flow of traffic, and using personnel to assist with the monitor and directing of traffic flow. Firefighters attack a vehicle fire targeting the passenger compartment first in order to protect the persons trapped inside the vehicle. This illustration depicts an example of how a safe work area is created at an incident scene. The fire apparatus creates a traffic barrier while cones and a spotter slow the traffic down. Firefighters need to be alert as some of the newer hybrid passenger vehicles may contain hydrogen fueling systems, compressed natural gas, or compressed liquefied petroleum gas and pressurized tanks. Other vehicles use electrical power systems with voltage as high as 600 volts and some use lithium batteries. A recent vehicle fire in North Carolina challenged firefighters as they faced 10 separate batteries charged for a total of 336 volts with 100 amps of electrical current. The burning lithium batteries added to the firefighters concern. Firefighters need to become familiar with these new power and fueling systems as they dramatically impact the behavior of fire and safety problems presented by these vehicles. Due to the recent demand issues with gasoline and diesel fuel, some vehicles use hydrogen gas. Others use a combination of natural gas and liquefied petroleum gas. And others use a combination of gases with electric motors and batteries. One vehicle uses refined cooking oil, resulting in greasy and fire-prone vehicles. Firefighters of the future will need to be experts in all type of vehicle fuel systems. And always be sure the battery is disconnected while operations are being conducted so an ignition of leaking flammable liquids does not occur. Always respond with sufficient resources to ensure ready availability in case a vehicle contains materials and or trapped persons. The first step is to carefully examine the situation using the decision making process to gather the needed information for developing a plan for safe strategy and tactics. If the fire can be safely attacked and sufficient water is available, the attack should be started from the downwind side and upslope if possible. Firefighters should use caution to prevent leaking flammable fuels from spreading onto other areas of the vehicle as persons may be trapped. Leaking fuel can spread into lower areas or storm drains surrounding the vehicle as well. In some cases, foam can be effective in this situation to provide extinguishment and containment and act as a flammable vapor blanket. A recreational vehicle contains living space for travel or camping on a seasonal basis. The variety of vehicles included in the classification of recreational vehicles range from a small pop-up tent trailer to a large bus-like vehicle containing all the amenities of home. These resources for cooking, bathing, and lighting pose the same hazards found in residential housing units. The only difference is recreational vehicles as well as motorhomes are mobile and the fuel lines and electrical connections are subject to vehicle accidents and vibrations as the vehicle moves along the highway. Mobile homes are classified into three categories, Class A, B, and C. The Class A units are designed and built as mobile homes. Class B units are converted from a basic van bought from a vehicle manufacturer. A Class C motorhome are units that use a cab portion and a motor from a vehicle manufacturer 
with the addition of a body generally containing an over-the-cab sleeping unit. Motorhome interiors are furnished with the same type of furniture, carpet, and appliances as a house. These furnishings contain a great deal of plastics, synthetic fibers, foam rubber, and paddle board to save both cost and weight. However, their installation significantly increases the amount of fire load per square foot. Frequently, passengers in motorhomes do not use seat belts, and when a vehicle accident occurs, these individuals are thrown about inside the mobile home, creating a need for medical services. Firefighters may be surprised to find entire families injured. Here is an illustration of a Class A motorhome. Fires in buses are not much different from fires encountered in large recreational vans or trucks. Like all the other vehicles examined, there are a wide variety of configurations designed to transport people. For example, there are school buses, public transportation buses, and group charter buses, as well as commercial bus lines. Because of the possibilities of persons being trapped inside the vehicle by a fuel-fed fire or a vehicle accident, quick fire attack and rescue extrication may be needed. While most buses are powered by diesel engines, many public operated buses are now being powered with natural gas or methane. Methane is the simplest hydrocarbon. It is odorless, colorless, and tasteless, and is the primary component of natural gas. It is a desirable fuel when compared to gasoline, not only because it provides a high heat value, but also because its combustion process produces less volatile organic compounds compared to the combustion of gasoline. For these reasons, many cities have elected to use compressed national gas as a fuel for city-operated buses. Methane is lighter than air, so the fuel storage location on the top of the bus is in a relatively safe location. Any leakage will rise into the atmosphere, and the firefighters do not need to concern themselves with the leaking fuel that may trap passengers. Trucks are vehicles that are designed to carry some type of cargo. The cargo varies greatly in size and shape as well as hazard. Cargo can be explosive or toxic and may not always be identified with a placard or warning label. Trucks are designed to carry goods great distances and as a result many have a sleeping compartment which can be exposed to fire from the inside of the compartment or from the cab or cargo area. A majority of international commodity transportation is shipped in containers, which can be easily unloaded from a ship and transferred quickly to a truck for ground transportation. These containers carry a wide variety of cargo, some of which may be hazardous and not marked as required. A number of potential fire and safety hazards may be encountered with a variety of goods carried by trucks. Firefighters must always proceed with fire extinguishing operations using caution until the cargo can be positively identified. Even if a non-hazardous cargo is burning in a large trailer, accessing the trailer can be dangerous as many trailers only have two double doors on the rear with no side access. This means firefighters are limited in the ways they can approach the fire during extinguishment of an interior cargo space. Saddle tanks are typically found on large trucks. These are large fuel tanks located on the side of the cab. They are usually under the driver and passenger doors. They can range from 50 to 250 gallons. The saddle tanks are vulnerable as they are mounted to the outside of the body frame and are exposed to damage from the vehicle accidents and road debris. Leaking fuel tanks can present a serious fire problem, as flowing fuel fires must be dealt with quickly because they can rapidly spread fire beyond the immediate area. There are serious life hazards to firefighters working in or around flowing fuel. The fuel tank is attached directly to the truck frame and is exposed to a side collision. The air supply tank for the braking system is located behind the fuel tank. Collision from the side could split the fuel tank and open the air brake system, which would automatically activate the braking system. Newer large tractor trailer trucks have a molded fiberglass air skirts to reduce air resistance as the truck moves down the highway. 
they can obscure the location of the saddle tags in their close relationship to the battery. Prior knowledge of trucks and their design is helpful to firefighters. A pre-planning walkthrough at a local truck dealership can be helpful in learning to locate and understand vehicle fuel and electrical systems. Some trucks are equipped with air suppression systems. Failure of this system releases air pressure causing the trailer to drop several inches. Firefighters working to extricate a victim under a trailer with an air suppression system should set cribbing in place before any rescue work is started. Firefighters will occasionally encounter a truck with its brakes on fire. The brakes can become overheated when applied. This is of special concern when a vehicle is traveling in a mountainous area and the heavy loaded vehicle is descending a long, steep, declining grade. When heated, the metal brake drums can crack if cooled too quickly. Firefighters should apply a fog spray in short bursts to slowly cool the heated drums. In most cases, the cargo area will be the concern on a truck or trailer fire or accident. Always check for hazardous material placards and do not take for granted the warning placards will be posted or that truck has proper placards. Also, trucks will have a bill of lading which will indicate the amount and type of cargo or freight being transported. Although a fire department may have an outstanding knowledge of its local building target hazards and have completed excellent pre-fire plans for dealing with these situations, some of the most dangerous problems a department may encounter are the freight trains which pass through its jurisdiction daily. Any fire department that covers an area which train tracks pass through has the potential to respond to a rail incident. Trains, like ships, can carry large amounts of people or large amounts of cargo, and in some cases a cargo may be hazardous. Light rail and subway systems, even though they do not typically carry cargo, can have a high life safety hazard when involved in fire because of the large numbers of people that they carry every day. The rail transportation of hazardous commodities is regulated by the U.S. Department of Transportation, the DOT. These regulations are enforced by the Federal Railroad Administration, the FRA. Rail transportation is a specialized business with special procedures, regulations, and equipment. It is highly recommended that firefighters use pre-planned guidelines to visit and pre-plan any rail facilities that they may have in their jurisdiction. For those fire departments that do not have rail facilities in the jurisdiction but have rail traffic running through their jurisdiction area, specialized drills and seminars can be arranged with rail officials. Locomotives are the power producers for the train. The diesel electric locomotive is a diesel power generator that creates electricity to power the train. To fuel the diesel engines, cross-country trains carry up to 5,000 gallons of fuel. A ruptured diesel tank can create a serious fire problem. There is a small chance of fire in a diesel engine itself. Most of the hazard is the electricity being generated by the large electrical generators driven by the diesel engines. Newer locomotives control the electrical power for the train with the specially designed switches and automated circuit breakers. Another factor making trains dangerous is their large size and weight. These provide inertia energy, so once the train is set in motion, a long distance is required before it can be stopped. Trains have a consist, or waybill, which identifies hazardous cargo on board. The engineer of the vehicle has the responsibility to maintain these documents. The documents can be found generally in the cab of the vehicle. Box cars get their name from their appearance, as they look like a box with attached wheels. They are designed to carry a variety of commodities, which may or may not be hazardous, and will have varied levels of combustibility. Box cars are designed to protect the cargo from weather elements and contamination. Often they are made out of wood, which adds fuel to the fire once a car is ignited. Some box cars may contain a refrigeration system. The compressor is electric and is powered by the diesel generator attached to the boxcar. The fuel for the generator is carried in a small fuel tank attached to the car. Flat cars are not enclosed, so they do not provide protection from the weather. They are designed and configured in different sizes depending on the type of cargo they are designed to carry. 
Some flat cars are constructed from wood materials so that the main fire concern is the wooden car and the cargo. Intermodal rail cars are flat cars with an intermodal container attached. The design of the container allows it to be transported and transferred quickly between ship, truck, or rail carrier. For example, an intermodal cryogenic container could be shipped by sea to a party, transferred by crane to a truck, trucked to a rail yard, loaded onto a flat car, transported to a rail yard across the nation, and then loaded back onto a truck for local delivery without ever having to offload the product. The hazards associated with intermodal equipment are related to the cargo itself. The cargo varies with a wide range of hazardous materials such as flammable gases, greases, and liquids, or pressurized gases and cryogenics. An intermodal tank is commonly referred to as an IM or IMO. An IMO 101 tank, like the totes, these are bulk tanks capable of carrying a large quantity of product. They're normally placed on ships and then delivered locally by a truck, although drains can also be used. Gondola cars are designed with flat bottoms and four walls. They may have a cover for the cargo being carried. Some are constructed of wood, but most are constructed of steel. Those constructed of wood can be a fire problem with some commodities, but in most cases, the only fire concern is the hazard of the cargo itself. Hopper cars are generally constructed using metal with sides and ends that are fixed. These cars are used to transport dry bulk materials such as fertilizers, chemicals, salt, flowers, and grains. The main hazard of a hopper car is the cargo itself. Passenger cars are real cars designed to carry people or provide specific services for passengers, such as riding, sleeping, dining, and luggage storage. Hazards associated with passenger cars begin with the numbers of persons on board. Unlike freight trains, which have a small number of crew persons, passenger trains may carry several hundred people. Older passenger cars have a combustible interiors and are subject to fires from smoking materials and other ordinary combustibles found in the passenger riding areas. Passenger cars are also equipped with cooling systems, air conditioning systems, and electrical systems. All these may contribute to or cause a fire problem that are of tactical concern to firefighters. Tank rail cars vary widely in size and capacity. Even though tank cars can carry products that are safe as purified water, a burning tank car fueled by a flammable liquid is a common image. The capacity of tank cars can range from a few hundred gallons to as much as 45,000 gallons of product. Tank cars have one or more compartments. They may be non-pressurized and carry a commodity such as gasoline or pressurized and carry LPG. Tank cars may also be interconnected by piping thus forming a tank train. Further, several one-ton containers of chlorine are commonly transported on a flat car, called a multi-unit tank car. The product and type of tank car play an important role in determining the basic fire suppression strategy and tactics. For example, if a flame is impinging on a pressurized rail car containing LPG and sufficient water supply is not available, or cannot be applied to a point of impingement in a sufficient quantity to cool and reduce the internal tank pressure, then evacuation in a defensive or no attack mode should be undertaken. Electric locomotives are powered with electricity from a third rail or overhead wire carrying between 25 and 50,000 volts. Firefighters need to make sure no one touches or crosses over the powered third rail or wire as electrocution can occur. Problems from a fire in a subway can be numerous. In a highly populated urban area, there is always a possibility of serious life loss as hundreds of persons can find themselves trapped on an underground train. The combination of poor lighting, intense heat, and dense smoke, along with a feeling of confinement in an enclosed space, 
combined to present a serious life threat to passengers, trainmen, and firefighters. Tunnels are poorly lit with a small emergency lights, and if the third rail is still energized, there is a serious life threat to all those working within the darkness of the tunnel. Reaching the heart of these fires is challenging, and in some cases they are extremely difficult to extinguish. Hose lines must be stretched by hand unless the subway is equipped with a built-in standpipe system. A breathing apparatus is always needed, and supplying fresh breathing bottles complicates an already serious firefight. Fires and other emergencies and rail transportation vehicles offer unique fire behavior and other safety related problems. For example, they combine high voltage electrical systems with diesel powered and electric engines to drive the train. Large amounts of fuel are needed to power the system, as many are cross country transporters. Rail systems are regulated by fire and safety requirements, which are not well understood by many fire departments and because they haul a wide variety of cargo, they have many different configurations of vehicles and cargo carrying units. Many of the cargoes are, are large quantities of hazardous materials, which if mixed can react explosively. Firefighters should first identify the hazard of the cargo, or the mix of hazards, and review the recommendations for evacuation distances found in the emergency guidebook. If the fire can be fought safely. It should be approached downwind with sufficient water supplies to protect the firefighters making the initial attack. A review of the attack recommendations for tank cars carrying compressed flammable gases is always needed as they are subject to blebby and special precautions need to be taken. Firefighters need to wear full PPE including SCBA as some of the materials carried can be extremely hazardous. The characteristics of aircraft fires and safety related issues differ from other transportation equipment and structure fires because of the speed at which these fires develop and the intensity of heat generated from burning fuel. Speed is of a concern in both takeoff and landing phases as research indicates that about 80% of aviation incidences occur in these two phases. To further complicate the safety problem, when the aircraft is in the air, there is no safe escape route, and passengers, once on the ground, find themselves in a long, narrow tube with very limited egress. The Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, regulates the amount and type of firefighting systems located at airports using an index system. Under federal regulations, aircrafts are sorted by their length into categories called indexes. They range from index A, where the aircraft is less than 90 feet in length, to index E, containing aircraft that are longer than 200 feet in length. The FAA requires fire protection equipment based on the frequency of aircraft landings, type of aircraft using runways, and the airport index. It is also important for responders to know that each plane is required to have an air bill for each flight. The air bill identifies hazardous materials being shipped by air. The captain is responsible for maintaining control of these papers located in the cockpit. Aircraft fuels are identified by their ease of ignition. They have a wide range of flammability and are of special design as they are subject to change altitudes, temperatures, outgassing of dissolved oxygen and movement of the fuel from the air turbulence. There are a variety of jet fuels, however the primary fuel used is identified as Jet A fuel. It is a kerosene grade fuel which because of the higher ignition temperature than gasoline is considered relatively safe during fueling operations. While the ignition temperature is higher than gasoline, this kerosene fuel, once ignited, is just as dangerous as gasoline fuel. Aqueous film-forming foam, AFFF, is particularly suited for application to fires and aircraft fuel spills. It readily supplies a surface film over kerosene because of its fluidity. AFFF flows smoothly, helping it to cover the fuel spill. It's a type of foam 
that is compatible with most dry chemical agents, which also may be needed on aircraft fires. Firefighters must be aware, however, that AFFF's drain rapidly and provide less burn-back resistance compared to protein-based foams. Aircraft fuels may also be released as a mist after the impact of an aircraft accident. The fuel mist is subject to hot metal, disrupted electrical current, and other ignition sources. If the fuel is in mist form, firefighters must be prepared for the possibility of an explosion or rapidly spreading fire. In some cases, foam can be used to hold vapors to a minimum and provide an escape avenue. Another concern with aviation fuels is the need to make sure that the aircraft is electrically grounded so it is not to create an opportunity for a static spark that could ignite available vapors. Most airport runways are equipped with an electrical grounding post to prevent explosions from sparks that may occur. Aircraft, like other transportation vehicles, are equipped with hydraulic systems and hydraulic fluids that are operated under pressure. Always approach heated hydraulic cylinders with extreme caution. A fluid under pressure, when released, will spray as a mist. The ignition source can ignite the mist, immediately resulting in a fire or explosion. Many aircraft have their own oxygen and air systems, which are automatically put into action if cabin pressure drops. These systems can increase the flammability materials in the passenger compartment including passengers' clothing. Firefighters need to understand the operation of these systems and know how to shut them down. Most jet aircraft have special electrical generating units working at 24 volts. These systems provide energy for a number of electrical power driven motors that drive the wings, flaps, rudders, and other electrical systems within the aircraft. Some jet aircraft have hydraulically powered systems to provide a backup for the aircraft control systems. Aircraft fire and safety familiarization drills at the local airport can assist firefighters in understanding the various design features of the aircraft using their jurisdictional airport. Anti-icing fluids are used to keep ice off the wings and moving parts of the wings and tail portions of the airship. These fluids are 85% alcohol and 15% glycerin. Some aircraft engines also may have alcohol water injection systems. While not as great as a hazard as other aircraft fluids, alcohol will burn an almost invisible blue flame and may require greater amounts of water to dilute the fuel. In most aviation settings, the amounts of alcohol are limited. An aircraft has a number of different pressurized cylinders. For example, oxygen cylinders have pressure relief valves, while some pressure cylinders may be used for hydraulic fluids, fire extinguishing systems, rain repellent systems, pneumatic systems, and other compressed gases. All of these cylinders have been known to explosively disintegrate during aircraft firefighting operations. Large aircraft tires may have pressures up to and in excess of 200 PSI. They are usually filled with nitrogen and inert gas to protect the tire from tremendous amounts of heat generated during takeoffs and landings. Because of the high pressure, these tires can explode with the force of a bomb when overpressurized, overheated, or damaged during a crash impact. Firefighters must take special caution when in close vicinity to these tires during firefighter operations. The larger jet aircrafts use escape slides, which are automatically deployed and inflated within a number of seconds from the time the exit opens in an emergency mode. Firefighters arriving at the crash scene must prepare to assist passengers as they exit these chutes, moving them quickly away from the aircraft's body in wing areas. Firefighters responding to military aircraft must be aware that explosives are used to eject the pilot seat and canopy in certain military aircraft. These devices eject the canopy and seat with great force. A pre-planning tour of the nearest military base is recommended to familiarize personnel 
with unique systems found on some military aircraft. One of the greatest dangers of military aircraft is the wide variety of armaments located in and on the aircraft. Military aircraft may also transfer hazardous materials. Special training and experience are important in dealing with military aircraft fires and incidents. Aircraft emergencies attract the public and media attention almost immediately. It is important to establish an area surrounding the crash to allow the performance of emergency operations as well as to protect the scene for evidence. In order to do so, there are generally two perimeter zones established around the aircraft crash. The inner security perimeter is a minimum of 300 feet from the outer limits of the wreckage and debris. This provides room for the first responders to perform firefighting, rescue, and medical functions as needed, and any crime scene or crash scene investigation work that needs to be done. This inner security zone is surrounded by an outer security zone designed to contain spectators and members of the press. The second zone should extend from the inner zone to a minimum distance at least another 300 feet. When first established, both areas must be large enough to open the space for all activities and keep the public safe. They both can be reduced later as the incident becomes more under control. The FAA provides one set of basic regulations that are adhered to worldwide. The FAA has maintained that the most critical issue associated with fire safety is the rate of heat release. As the rate increases, the time available for safe egress from the vehicle decreases rapidly. The FAA subdivides aircraft incidents into three types of fire scenarios. The first scenario involves a fire after an air crash where the aircraft fuel ignites resulting in fire penetration into the fuselage or passenger area. The second and third fire situations involve fires occurring while the aircraft is in flight. These fires occur in the passenger cabin or in the cockpit and spread rapidly in spite of being quickly detected. The third fire situation involves a fire that remains undetected for a time such as when a fire occurs in a hidden area. Some aircraft now have heat sensors with extinguishment systems in the cargo areas. Fires in aircraft engines on the ground are generally not serious because the fire attack can be made directly by ground units. There is a difference, however, depending on whether it's a piston-driven engine or a turbine engine. If the fire is contained with the engine to sell, the first effort should be tried to extinguish the fire by using the onboard extinguishing system. If this fails, then the fire will be needed to be extinguished using clothes lines with fog nozzles to provide enough cooling to control the fire. Fires in the combustion chamber of jet engines are best controlled if the engine can be kept turning over. Extreme caution should be observed, however, when working around a jet engine. Personnel should never stand within 25 feet of the front or the side or directly to the rear of jet engine outlets. The suction created by some engines is strong enough to draw in a 200 pound person. Personnel should also stand clear of the turbine or rotation area. In the event of the engine disintegration, this area will be in the path of flying metal parts. The area to the rear of the exhaust outlet should also be avoided for a distance of at least 150 feet. Exhaust temperatures reach approximately 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit at the outlet. The extinguishment of fires that are outside of the combustion chamber but within the engine nacelle should be first attempted by using the aircraft's built-in extinguishing system by the pilot or crew. If this is unsuccessful, the carbon dioxide or dry chemicals should be tried. However, these extinguishers should not be used if magnesium or titanium metals are involved. Under these circumstances, it is best to let the fire burn itself out. Former water spray could be used to keep the nacelle and surrounding exposed parts of the aircraft cool. Potential wheel fires should be approached with caution. The responding fire apparatus should be parked within an effective firefighter distance from the aircraft but never to the side of the aircraft or in line with the wheel's axle. 
if the tire should explode, tire debris are generally thrown out to the sides, but not to the front or to the rear. Consequently, if it is necessary for firefighters to approach the aircraft, it should be done from the front or rear. Smoke around the brake drums and tires does not mean that the wheel is on fire, as overheating of brakes often occurs. If the brakes are overheated, they should be allowed to cool by air only, using a smoke ejector to help reduce the cooling time. Do not use water for cooling, as a rapid reduction of heat on the wheels may result in an explosion. Carbon dioxide extinguishers are frequently used for cooling wheels, and can be used if there is an actual flames on the wheel. However, a dry chemical extinguisher is preferred and recommended because it is less likely to chill the metal in, in the wheel parts. Water can be used only when a dry chemical extinguisher is not available. However, it should be used with caution. Firefighters should protect themselves from a possible explosion by using the fire apparatus as a shield. The water should be applied in a fine spray in short bursts of 5 to 10 seconds. At least 30 seconds should elapse between bursts. Water should be used only as long as flames are visible. Aircraft fires and incidents present unique problems considering that the passengers are essentially trapped in an aluminum tube surrounded by flammable fuel. The fuel, once released, can quickly invade the passenger compartment and engulf the entire aircraft in flames. Quick departure from the aircraft or evacuation by the passengers and rapid extinguishment actions by the firefighters are absolutely necessary to save lives. The size up of these incidents must consider the escape and extinguishment of the fire. If the fire cannot be extinguished, then a relatively safe escape route must be provided by confinement of the fire using a rapid intervention vehicle. An aircraft rapid intervention vehicle is a large pumper specifically designed for aircraft firefighting. It carries large amounts of water and foam. Some of these vehicles have two engines. One engine propels the vehicle quickly, while the second engine powers the pump, allowing a fast-moving attack while pumping foam or water. Aviation firefighters also have special temperature-resistant protective clothing designed to withstand high temperatures generated by aviation fuels. Special tools are used to penetrate the aircraft's skin to provide the application of foam inside the fuselage when needed. Specialized training and equipment are needed for aircraft firefighting. The possibility of a small boat fire exists in any department's jurisdiction that has a body of water of any size. In most cases, small boats are brought to the water on a trailer, but some boats may be docked in a boat marina. Boat marinas will vary in size from those docking only a few boats to those storing a large number. The method of storage usually consists of one or more floating docks extending outward into the body of water. Getting water to a boat fire may be a problem if the boat is tied up to a dock far from the shoreline and water is not available. Again, during the fire pre-planning, firefighters should develop an alternative method to obtain water. Some of the larger boat marinas provide hydrants adjacent to the walkways. They should be tested periodically. At other marinas, it would be necessary to draft the supply of hose lines. If engines cannot be positioned close enough to draft, a siphon ejector may be used. Fires in the cabin or superstructure area should be attacked using foam or water spray systems. A single inch and a half or inch and three quarter line will normally be sufficient for a small fire in a boat. Two lines will normally be required if the fire is a sizable or in a small yacht. A fire in a small yacht should be attacked from both sides so it's not to push the fire into an adjacent dock boat. Most fires on small boats start near the engine or in the bottom area of the boat. This area in some cases traps flammable vapors which may be ignited when the engine is started and the fire is usually initiated with an explosion. 
A carbon dioxide or dry chemical extinguisher is very effective if the fire is fairly well contained under the floor decking and does not advance too far. Water in the form of fog or spray streams is also effective. However, it presents the possibility of sinking the boat and spreading the burning fuel to the adjacent waterway. Thought should always be given to extending the protection to the boat's dock nearby. Regardless of the methods used to extinguish the initial fire, there will probably be glowing materials and the combustible furnishings in the boat. These items need to be thoroughly overhauled. There is also a possibility of the considerable amounts of unburnt gasoline in the bilge that will have to be siphoned into an approved container or it may be necessary to request a flammable liquid vacuum truck if the spill is excessive. Caution should be taken to ensure that the wiring is disconnected from the batteries and that the shorelines prior to commencing these operations. It may be necessary to pump out the boat to keep it from sinking if too much water is used. In the United States, regulations are established by the federal government and enforced by the U.S. Coast Guard. There may also be local and state laws, but in most cases these are usually in accordance with federal regulations. For international waters, a treaty was approved by a Convention of Concerned Nations titled The Safety of Life at Sea, SOLAS. This international treaty contains minimum fire standards and related safety issues for ships on international voyages. Because the United States is a signatory to the SOLAS Treaty, U.S. registered ships using international waters must comply with these provisions. Another agency concerned with fires and safety regulations at sea is the International Maritime Organization, the IMO. It is an agency of the United Nations specializing in maritime affairs. IMO consists of national governments of maritime activities. It has the responsibility for maintaining the SOLAS Treaty and has issued a number of fire test methods which are referenced in the SOLAS Treaty. Fires aboard ships are greatly influenced by the conductivity of the steel construction. The conductivity and transmission of heat by the steel can spread the fire among the compartments, making fires more difficult to control than most structure fires. In addition to the conductivity of the steel hull, other problems include the generation of smoke and heat. Ship cargo holds are often confined spaces where smoke and heat can build up. Without proper ventilation and the combination of intense heat and its thick toxic smoke, makes fire extinguishment dangerous and difficult for firefighters. Ships have bulkheads, which are the main wall or supporting structure, generally made out of steel. Some bulkheads are watertight and fire resistive. They can be designed and constructed to prevent the spread of water and fire if the ship has been damaged. As with all fires, size up requires the first arriving firefighter to determine the location of the fire, find out what is burning, and determine the extent of the fire. Cargo ships are required to have a dangerous cargo manifest or a listing of what is being carried on the ship. It is important to find out if any hazardous materials are being carried and if so, in what cargo holds are they being stored and the hazard that they present. One problem using water to extinguish fires on a ship is the possibility of capsizing the ship as firefighting water may be absorbed by the cargo or added water can upset the ship's flotation balance and impact the stability of the ship. The responsibility for the stability of the ship is not with the fire department but with the ship's officer. So it is important to keep in close communication with the ship's officers if the stability of the ship is being threatened due to the amount of water being pumped into the hold. Tanker ships present a fire problem that differs from the cargo ship as the tanks or cargo area contains flammable liquids which may be extinguished by suffocating the fire. Generally, one of two types of extinguishing systems are installed. The two systems are either CO2 
or a stream system. Both will work on flammable liquids if all cargo tank openings can be closed to reduce the inflow of additional air. Once a ship's fire extinguishing system is in service, firefighters need to verify that the system is operating properly. In some cases, it may not be possible to close all the openings, and foam will be the only effective agent available. Water can be used sparingly, spraying to pre-cool the liquid prior to the application of the foam. Foam should not be applied if materials such as asphalt or tar are involved, as this could result in a steam explosion. Marine fires have many of the same hazards that complicate firefighting activities as other classification of transportation vehicles. Like aircraft, when on the water and carrying passengers, safe, to, safe evacuation is important, as boat and ship fires can move quickly and produce great deal of deadly smoke. Ships carry a wide variety of cargo, some of which may be hazardous. The electrical, fuel, and ventilation systems can malfunction, creating either a fire or other safety problem. Small boats are constructed of wood, fiberglass, or aluminum, all of which can burn or create safety problems for those on board. Larger ships are mostly constructed of steel, with large cargo spaces, which are poorly ventilated. The steel transmits heat, which can spread the fire to other cargo compartments. In sizing up these fires, firefighters need to obtain a cargo manifest to determine the nature of any problems presented by the cargo and the type of condition the onboard firefighting system, if one is available. Full protective clothing with SCBA and an extra supply of air bottles will be needed if a large fire occurs. Fire pre-planning and close coordination with the harbor master is highly recommended to prepare firefighters for marine fires. Here's a picture of a cargo ship coming into port. This may look very familiar in the Boston area as these come in almost daily. A review of the average annual transportation fires show that fires and related safety issues in transportation vehicles represent a big problem for firefighters in the United States. Each year, approximately 400,000 fires occur in vehicles, almost two-thirds of the average number of structure fires. Each category of transportation fires presents specific fire and safety related problems. These problems are found in the propulsion or power systems, the fuel, the electrical and hydraulic systems, in the cargo areas. These locations present situations where uncontrolled fires and hazardous materials can create a safety hazard. For the sake of safety, it is important to pre-plan and review the design and specifications of transportation vehicles that firefighters may encounter during a fire. And this concludes Chapter 9, Transportation Fires and Related Safety Issues. Thank you.